please put your hands together and welcome Shella Ramanan. That was an intimidatingly warm round of applause. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hello and welcome to Making Games for Real. So this is going to be a talk about making games about serious real-world topics and experiences, and importantly, making them in a way that is respectful and representative. I'm going to talk about the approach we took on, before I forget, our debut game. I'm also going to talk about our approach on Windrush Tales, a game that's still in, a, in development and which is here available to play at Adventure X. And um, the talk will look at choosing an idea, um, building on it, and the early stages of making it into a game without fucking it up. Um, not fucking it up is not guaranteed after listening to this talk, though. So first, a little bit about me. My name is Shella Ramanan, and I am a narrative designer and writer currently working in the AAA and indie space. I'm one half of Threefold Games alongside Claire Morwood, and together we make narrative games that tell stories from new or underrepresented perspectives. And finally, I'm also the co-founder of Pock in Play, an organization focused on increasing the visibility and representation of BIPOC people, both in games and in the games industry. This isn't all of the team pictured here, so I just want to do a shout out to Satish and Sitara, who are also here. Hey, there's a Pock in Play here. <laughs> Pock in Play team in the house. <laughs> And so on to the games I've made and I'm making. So Before I Forget was my first game and it was the debut game from Threefold Games. And it is a narrative exploration game about an Indian woman with dementia. It began life at the XX Plus Game Jam in Bristol and that's where I met Claire for the first time. And that Game Jam literally changed my life because four years later, in 2020, we released Before I Forget, and it was nominated for a BAFTA in the category Games Beyond Entertainment. Currently, I live in Malmö in Sweden, where I'm senior narrative designer on Avatar Frontiers of Pandora at Massive Entertainment, which is a Ubisoft studio. So this is my day job writing about blue aliens. It's big and it's shiny and it's the complete other end of the scale to the games that I make at Threefold Games. It is bigger and flashier, but um, it's still a, a story that holds a mirror up to the real, real world and real world themes and issues. Um, but I'm not gonna be talking about Avatar in this talk. And currently, because apparently making one game isn't challenging or time-consuming enough, I'm also in development on Windrush Tales. And um, I'm the creative director of this project, which started as a small idea I had way back in 2017, because uh, game dev is long. <laughs> Um, Windrush Tales is an illustrated branching narrative game about a period of immigration when people from the Caribbean and the wider Commonwealth were invited to Britain to help rebuild the country after the war. And um, with that said, these are two games, so before I forget, like ignoring <laughs> Avatar, um, before I forget and Windrush Tales are two games with exploring very different topics, but both needing a lot of careful consideration. So let's look at some of the stages of the decisions I found in common with making these games. So one of the things that we got asked a lot by journalists who interviewed us about Before I Forget was why, like, why did you decide to make a game about dementia? And I think they were expecting us to say that, oh, my grandfather died of dementia, or I know someone, and fortunately for Claire and myself, we aren't in that position. We didn't have like real world experience of, of dementia. But um, thinking about that question, I think it's a really crucial question that um, developers can ask themselves. 
Um, and that's basically what this talk is about. So why did we make Before I Forget? So like I said, it began life at the XX Plus Game Jam in 2016. And here are some like really, really early, oh, really early images of the game. <laughs> the game. Um, so in terms of why dementia, um, so as a writer, I was really interested in memory loss and what it means, like how, what it means when someone loses their memory, what happens to the person inside, because obviously there's still somebody there. And um, yes, yeah, so that was something that preoccupied me. And I, before the game jam, I um, had a look through my ideas book. Um, and there was this just written down, it just said woman with dementia and it was nothing more than that. And then at the game jam, the theme was borders. And at the time there was a Syrian refugee crisis and Trump was threatening to build a wall, uh, um, a wall, or <laughs> not a wall, but um, probably that too. But um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there were lots of sort of geopolitical border issues going on. So we kicked around some ideas. And then I said, what about um, psychological borders? Because um, I have this idea for a woman with dementia. I didn't have an idea. I just had the two, the three words, woman with dementia. Um, but immediately that kind of sparked ideas for us. Um, we had a setting. So she's in a house. Um, so there are rooms in the house that you go into and maybe there are objects in each of the rooms and you interact with them. And then we were like, so what if the house is in grayscale gray and when you interact with an object, it triggers a memory and then color comes back into that room. And that is basically, before I forget, in a nutshell. Oops. Um, so the why of Before I Forget was a combination of things. So it was, you know, memory loss is interesting. It fitted the theme of the game jam. And it was also because games don't usually cover this. So it's unique and um, it was r extremely topical at the time. You know, dementia was in the news a lot and the World Health Organization was, you know, really concerned with it. So it was like, it was topical and interesting. And it also gave us an opportunity to have an older woman as a protagonist, exploring something that affects lots of people, in fact, too many people, um, but something that's so common um, in the world but isn't represented in games. And then lastly, the idea was just perfectly suited to the medium. So I'd had those words written in that notebook for quite a long time and I'd kind of toyed around with like, I'd pondered the, the story and what it might be, but it wasn't until I posited it as a game that the story just like came to life and wrote itself. So yeah, so examining your why can be a really interesting way of um, looking at your creative motivation. Um, and it doesn't have to be a way to stop you from taking on this really difficult thing. It's just about being clear about your creative motivation, intentions. So regarding Windrush Tales, um, so I'm making Windrush Tales because I am a child of Windrush. Um, my dad was from Grenada, which is a small island in the Caribbean, and he came to the UK in the 50s. So it's part of my heritage, and I wanted to celebrate it. So um, the 70th anniversary, yes, I know it's five years later, but <laughs> game dev is still long, um, even by this slide. Um, so yeah, I wanted to celebrate my heritage for the 70th anniversary, and I was like, shall I write a story? Shall I do a poem? Shall I write an essay? And then I was like, what about a game? because I hadn't seen the British Caribbean experience represented in games. And um, so, yeah, nobody else was doing that, so that made it interesting. Um, so this is basically the first video game about Windrush, so it's unique. And also because, um, so this is a story of people, this is like an odyssey. Um, so this is a story of people on an island who get on a boat and go across an ocean 
and they land on another island and then they don't know what they're going to find there and they're grappling with what happens when they arrive. Now that is the stuff of sort of myths and legends. That is a universal story, so why wouldn't we want to see a game about that? Um, I'm also incredibly proud that we have a majority black British Caribbean team on Windrush Tales. So it was um, a really unique development opportunity to give people opportunities, basically, to work on a project like this. And so um, those were the whys of Windrush Tales. And now I'm going to look at a hypothetical why. So um, because it's cool. And it's just, this is quite often the sort of initial thing that kind of sparks in you when you, when you find something that you're kind of interested in. And it's, and it's a valid initial reason to like go down a particular route. Um, so this is a photo of the Agoji warrior women of the Dahomey Kingdom, which is modern day Benin. And um, yeah, and they're uh, the inspiration for the Dora Milaje in the um, Black Panther films and the um, comics. And so, you know, like, you say you come across this photo and you're like, oh, that's cool. These, like, warrior women, they really existed and they look badass. And so you decide that maybe they will fit in your game or you want to make a game with them in because it's kind of cool. And that's a fair reason, but at some point, like really quickly, you need to go beyond because it's cool. You have to have more than that um, because otherwise your game design decisions are likely to follow that same reasoning. So like for instance, you might go, well, we have like a certain aesthetic on our game and this doesn't kind of fit, so we'll give this to the art team and see if they can like, you know, like make it a bit sexier. And we know how that goes. Um, and then maybe, um, let me see if this one works. Yes. Because then you go, well, I don't know anything about Benin. So like, what about Egypt? Like everybody knows Egypt. Egypt's cool, it's got the pyramids and pharaohs and stuff. And um, so you've taken these real world people, um, moved them to the other side of the continent and then Egypt, like, what does that even mean? So if you're talking ancient Egypt, that's 3,000 years. Were these women even contemporaries of any of those thousands of years? I mean, we have an actual photograph of them, so it might suggest that no, they're not. <laughs> um, so you're kind of on this slippery slope to cultural appropriation, basically. You've appropriated this culture, you've removed, you've decontextualized it, moved it to another culture, which you've then reduced to, I mean, okay, you've reduced it to 3,000 years, but um, there's like the Egypt that happened after that, you know, it's like an extremely rich civilization. There's contemporary Egypt, and um, yeah, so you've just like ignored all of this because it's cool. So how to do it um, in a way that respects your topic. So the first stop is usually going to be films and mainstream media, and that is what we did for Before I Forget and Windrush Tales. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as it's not your only source. And this might seem like a sort of like, duh, of course I'm gonna like read stuff about my thing, but um, I've, too many times I've seen rep representations of like black communities that seems like they saw boys in the hood and some hip hop videos and then like thought they knew what black culture was. Um, so yeah, I think it's always good to reiterate that um, you have to look beyond mainstream media for your um, like sources. And um, so, yeah, so we looked at books and other fiction, and then maybe if um, your topic allows, other games might have covered it. And, um, and then your research has to go beyond fiction. For before I forget, that meant asking, what is dementia? We knew what we thought it is, but all our ideas of the disease pretty much came from either short news segments or, um, or films. So with Before I Forget, the challenge was making a game that was both an engaging experience 
and something that represents dementia respectfully, as opposed to offering a distorted or cliched perception of this disease. So memory loss, we found, is... Um, well, so memory loss is the, the symptom that we all associate with dementia. Um, but as we started making the game and researching the disease, we discovered that everyone's symptoms are different, and dementia is kind of this umbrella term for loads and loads of different symptoms. Um, and so our research uh, gave us actually lots of ideas for the game. Um, sometimes they presented us with challenges, so things that we couldn't do. But um, we ultimately, we decided that we needed more expertise to help us. So um, because we were aware that we couldn't get our, all our information from pop culture, we worked with two medical professionals. And we found them through this organization called Gaming the Mind, which is a group of um, psychologists who are interested in and research the intersection of mental health and video games. And through them, we met two doctors, and they would play different builds of the game and give us feedback. And um, just to ensure that our portrayal was like clinically sound and just to get their perspective on it as experts. And as a direct result of working with these doctors, we also found ways to use dementia symptoms to solve um, game design problems. So, for instance, the player pathway, um, we had um, a rug. We discovered that, like, patterned objects uh, could be um, seen as either a hole or a, a change in level, and they might trip over it. So we used that to, like, block a certain player pathway that uh, we didn't want the player to go down. And then as the writer on Before I Forget, I edited the way Sunita refers to objects um, uh, because the sort of linguistic degradation is such in dementia that people remember the function of an object rather than the form. So, for instance, a watch I'd described as a round metal object became a timekeeping thing. So their expertise was like actually really inspiring rather than limiting um, what we could do and what we couldn't do in the game. And it was ultimately it was invaluable. So similarly with Windrush Tales, we had the opportunity to consult experts and our experts were the Caribbean community. So this time around, um, we got pre-production funding, um, which is a small miracle. Um, and Oka was one of our funders and their support allowed us to conduct, conduct two workshops with Caribbean elders. And um, Oka helped us connect with an academic who specializes in migrant narratives and mental health called Jenny Olsop. And she helped us put together to these workshops. So basically in the first workshop, um, we didn't have a build of the game at that point. So we had a concept and character backgrounds and things like that. And so we just talked with these people about their experience in terms of their first impressions of the UK and things they remembered and then um, looked at our characters and whether they found them believable and like some of the themes we were going to tackle in the game. And then at the second workshop some months later, we had a build of the game. So we had breakout rooms and um, played the game for them whilst allowing the participants to make the choices, the narrative choices. And then we came back together in the room to discuss their experience of the game and their thoughts. And I'm not gonna lie, these workshops were kind of tough. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, is there a bone-crushing weight of responsibility and expectation on Windrush Tales? Why, yes, thank you for asking, there is. <laughs> but we're going to make it anyway. But, um, yeah, so getting the feedback is always really emotional on anything that you make, but um, in those workshops there was this sense of excitement and um, then there was like this realization for us of the, the, 
the multitude of ways we could disappoint them. <laughs> and so it was kind of overwhelming. And um, yeah, basically, it's too much for one, for one game. So we just have to kind of take a breath and keep going. So how do you get from this bunch of Im information to, to a game? And that is probably the title for another talk, uh, maybe next year. Um, but at this point, it's about kind of absorbing all your research. Um, and then you can kind of reassess your reason why, because you found out new things about your topic. And um, it should have evolved from because it's cool. Fingers crossed. But. Um, so remember that not all feedback needs to be acted on. Um, you can't please everyone with one story. And um, all you can do with it is uh, approach it with as much respect and sensitivity as you are able. So there's another aspect of why that I'd like to touch on, and that's the fact that um, games and the idea of play comes with connotations of childishness and frivolity and just a thing to waste time. And video games as an industry um, has a hard time kind of shaking this off. So even within itself, within its own discourse, so criticism, say, of themes of um, themes or insensitivities of a game are often met with the old mantra, it's only a game or it's not that deep. But really we know that that's not true. At least I don't want it to be. And as Threefold Games, Claire and I are focused on making games that challenge what games can be and who they are about and who they are for. So for some people, before I forget, was the first game they'd ever played. Um, they wanted to play it because they were interested or touched by dementia or because they wanted to play as an older person or because they knew Sunita is Indian and because it was short. So that made it more accessible to lots of people. So, um, you know, if you have a short game and it's this thing you've never done before, it, um, it's like, well, it's only an hour. I can, I can give it a try. And as a result, we found that um, it reached different audiences. And even within gamer communities, people who didn't really play indie games wanted to play before I forget because they'd had some experience of dementia. And so Windrush Tales, we found the same thing. Um, we found that it's like bridged generations. Even within our workshops, we found um, sort of parents and children were coming. So children would be like, there's this cool game about, you know, our community. And the parents like, well, OK, because you're interested in this. I'll come along and see what this is about. And then um, we've exhibited at the British Library this summer. And we were also at EGX in the left field collection. And, you know, we've like seen on Twitter and like photos um, from the event that there are like literally like Carib British Caribbean families playing it together. And like the elders are reading it in their accents. And um, yeah, it's just reaching so many people, which is just awesome and something we couldn't have predicted. And reaching people is um, partly why we made Before I Forget. Um, it's why we're making Windrush Tales, and it's why Threefold Games continues to look for new perspectives or themes to make into games. So um, don't forget um, to ask yourself why, but not as a reason to stop you from making something, but as an opportunity to interrogate your creative motivation and intentions for tackling something challenging. It's hard, but it's also rewarding. So thank you. Thank you, Shella. We have some time for questions. If anyone wants to put their hand in the air, I will bring you the microphone. Uh, 
Hiya. Um, my question is about research. Um, so I thought it was quite interesting you talking about how you get from this very, very surface level research into dementia, into the sort of more uh, deeper level stuff, going to um, specialists to sort of uh, gain further research, so and so forth. I, it's a very open ended uh, question, but sort of how do you know when enough is enough? How do you know, like, okay, actually, th there's enough here to start to sort of create interesting, complex ideas rather than letting the research guide the thing you're creating, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It's interesting. Um, I don't know. I guess, yeah, you just kind of sense that you have enough. I guess what it is, is like maybe you could <laughs> make a start and then you have to have, that feedback has to be ongoing. Um, is basically uh, what I'd advise. So you do your initial research, and then you find, oh, you maybe start, and then you find, we need more expertise, because I'm not sure we're going on the right track, and then you have your expertise, and like, for instance, with the doctors, that was ongoing feedback we had with them over, over months. Um, they didn't play it all the way to the end of development, because I think we got a sense of um, the things as, it, you know, the iteration, um, the, the comments kind of, they didn't have as much feedback because we'd kind of got it at that point, I think. So, yeah, I think it has to be ongoing. Um, you have to check in that you're still on track, basically. But then allow yourself enough creative freedom to not get bogged down in research because you could just, like, end up <laughs> reading books and books forever. Hello. Um, I'm quite curious how you're balancing being a senior narrative designer and running your own company. It sounds <laughs> very intense. So, yeah, I'm really curious. Yeah, I d uh, yeah anyone? <laughs> uh, how do I balance that? I probably don't. There are probably days where it's not balanced at all. Um, probably days where I just like work too much. Um, but yeah, I just have this thing that has to be made. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just do, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it basically. <laughs> uh, yeah, kill me if I do it again, please. <laughs> Somebody stop me. <laughs> yeah, would not recommend, but um, sometimes you have a thing that has to be done. <laughs> Let that be a warning. Any more questions? Uh, <laughs> I pass this down, please. Hi, um, I'm curious about um, thinking about the gameplay and I'm curious how you go about thinking about how you connect like the actions and what people are doing within the game to the sort of meanings and the ideas that you're trying to uh, get across in the game itself. Yeah, so with, before I forget, um, I guess we had that concept of the um, color back coming back into the world and things like that like really early on before we knew very much about dementia at all because I guess that was our perception you know it's memory loss and it's regaining memory um, but then we had um, so one of the things that we did for our demo was a sequence where she needs to go to the toilet and she's forgotten where the bathroom is so um, we had this uh, loop where every door that you open in the house leads back to the wrong room, leads back to a hall closet to kind of um, uh, try and represent that kind of experience of like panic and just not understanding what's going on. And yeah, I guess it was just, how did we do that? <laughs> I'm looking at Claire right now. <laughs> How did we do it? I don't know, it was just lots of conversations and I guess like, um, you know, like meeting the social worker who told us about the patterns and the rugs and then that just kind of like triggering an idea that we could use in game design. Um, you know, it's almost like the, the talk we had this morning about black British culture and using those things that you have around you and um, just uh, interrogating how that can inform your game design. Um, does that answer your question? I don't know. I think I just rambled. 
<laughs> we have time for a couple more. I can see a, a hand here. Hi, um, my question is more directed um, as from a writing perspective. You said some of these ideas originated from game jams. Um, so I was just wondering if you could share a little bit of how the experience went when you started the idea collaborating with other people, especially because I know in game jams you are quite limited for time. Um, so just wondering how, if you could share a little bit of how that was. Uh, sorry, could you? That was quite long. Sorry. <laughs> I lost the um, thread. <laughs> um, when starting developing your idea in a game jam, could you um, share how, how, um, <laughs> Trying to trying to phrase my question. Um, did you have a time limit to come up with the base for your idea, and how did you communicate as a writer mm -hmm. these ideas? Yeah, I mean, we did have a time limit. I think it was like thirty six hour game jam or something. And yeah, so like I said, like on that slide where I was like, um, we were like, okay, so we have a house with some rooms and. We did that in, I don't know, it would have been like 20 minutes or something like that. We had this 20 minute brainstorm on, you know, what this idea was and it came up with the sort of like the, um, the core of the game that never really changed from that through development. So um, yeah, for somehow, uh, I guess, uh, just that magic thing happened <laughs> where the idea aligned with uh, the game design and um, and then because we were under such pressure as a writer, um, I think we got the story idea kind of laid out almost at the same time because because it was like such a time pressure. It's like and then we can do this and the music can do that and I was like and the story's going to go like this and it's like and it, yeah it was kind of like that basically, and then I think I wrote it at like scribbled it on a pa paper at like midnight that night and stuff like that. So um, I don't know does that. Answer. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Perhaps one more. Is that okay with you? <laughs> Perhaps one more. Does anyone have a burning question? I'll go to the. Uh, I'll go to you if that's all right. Hello. Um, my question is that a lot of the studios I've worked at haven't been like particularly diverse spaces, so often. When I enter that space, I find that because I'm from like mixed race background, like woman of color background, I often feel a lot of pressure to be the person that often raises a lot of the points that you raised in your deck. So I was just wondering if you have any advice about how to navigate that pressure or whether you have any experiences of also feeling that kind of pressure. Hmm. I mean, I think I've been lucky <laughs> um, that my, even in my AAA job, my team, even if it's not diverse, like ethnically diverse, um, they've all been, I guess they were kind of handpicked, you know, to have that cultural sensitivity, to um, be engaged and curious. So I'm like really incredibly lucky um, to have not, really had that experience where um, I feel like I'm the angry black woman on the team <laughs> or something, you know, it's just like, um, I don't know how to navigate that. Um, it's tricky, if it's, a, if it's a small company, then it's tricky, you're kind of like stuck. Uh, if it's a bigger studio, um, you can maybe like network with other narrative people maybe, or um, you know, like find a network of people who can support your um, feedback. Yeah, I don't know, it's a tricky one. If anyone else <laughs> knows, let us know. Um, I, I think we need to wrap it up there. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry that it ended on, on that note of, um, of... Yeah, of just me going... I mean, I could try and answer, <laughs> but... Uh, thank you very much, Shella. Thank you. <laughs>